How's it going? This video is going to be an introduction to psychopathy. Uh, when you uh, depersonalize another person and view them as just an object, uh, an object for pleasure instead of a, a living, breathing human being. And in this video, I'm going to review different descriptors of psychopathy so you have a good overview of what exactly it is. And I'm going to go over how it differs from antisocial personality disorder. So more specifically, the things I'm going to go over in this video are Hervey Cleckley's descriptions of psychopathy from his book, The Mask of Sanity. I'm going to quickly review Robert Hare's psychopathy checklist. I'm going to differentiate antisocial personality disorder from psychopathy. And then I'm going to quickly summarize psychopathy in three words. So to get started, The Mask of Sanity was a book published in 1941 by Hervey Cleckley. And it's the book that brought the term psychopath into popular usage. So Cleckley interviewed hundreds of prisoners, and he found that there was a subsection of them that were particularly callous and not emotional. And he found that this group didn't have attachment to other people, and they didn't have a fear of getting caught or punished. The Mask of Sanity is considered the most seminal work in the clinical description of psychopathy. And in it, he gives 16 descriptors that define the profile of what psychopathy is. So I'll go quickly through them. The first is superficial charm and good intelligence. Think of American Psycho. The second is absence of delusions and other signs of rational thinking. So that helps to differentiate it from a psychotic disorder like schizophrenia. The third is absence of nervousness. The fourth is unreliability. The fifth is untruthfulness. The sixth is lack of remorse and shame. The seventh is poorly motivated antisocial behavior. The eighth is poor judgment and failure to learn from experiences. The ninth is pathological egocentricity and incapacity for love. The tenth is poverty of major affective reactions. And eleventh is loss of insight. The twelfth is unresponsiveness and general interpersonal relations. And the thirteenth, which is my personal favorite, fantastic and uninviting behavior with drink, and sometimes without. The fourteenth is suicidal threats that are rarely carried out. The fifteenth is sex life impersonal, trivial, and poorly integrated. And the sixteenth is failure to follow any life plan. I normally don't like just straight lists and try to not include them in videos, but this is a historically important conceptualization of psychopathy. And I also think it just gives you a good general overview and kind of gives you a good picture of the kind of person that a psychopath is. Reading through this list gives you a good mental picture of the kind of person a psychopath is. Otto Kernberg, who's probably one of the most important psychoanalysts, felt this was a good clinical picture of psychopathy. But he felt that there were four that were a little questionable. And those four were absence of nervousness, fantastic with drink, suicide not carried out, and superficial charm. But moving on. So Cleckley considered the fundamental factor that ties together the clinical picture of psychopathy is the inability to participate or understand the emotional aspects of humanity. And that's why the book is called The Mask of Sanity, because outwardly they appear normal, but underlying there's just something missing. And he hypothesized that psychopathy has an underlying neurological defect that leads to what he calls a semantic dementia. And by that, he meant that they lack the ability to emotionally understand the meaning of life as lived by ordinary people. And it's also referring to the fact that psychopaths use language differently, because they feel no emotions and there's no emotional content connected to their words. And I like the quote that they know the words, but they can't hear the music. And the following quote really captures what I'm trying to say. Let us say that despite his otherwise perfect functioning, the major emotional accompaniments are absent, or so attenuated as to count for little. If we grant the existence of a far-reaching and persistent blocking, absence, deficit, or dissociation of the sort, we have all that is needed at the present level of our inquiry to account for the psychopath. Ooh, it's a little spooky. And the next important person we're going to go over is Robert Hare. He repopularized the construct of psychopathy and criminology with his checklist. So his checklist is called the Psychopathy Checklist, or the Hare Psychopathy Checklist, or the Psychopathy Checklist Revised. So shortened, it's PCL or PCLR. And it came out of a lack of reliable tools for assessing psychopathy. Basically, it just uses a semi-structured interview, and then it rates each of the 20 items on a three-point scale. And you can either get a 0, a 1, or a 2 on each item. So the highest score you can get is 40. And a cutoff score of 30 or greater is used to diagnose psychopathy. And one of the highest scorers in the history of psychopathy is Ted Bundy. So he got a 39 out of 40, and that dude's a pretty big creeper. So let's quickly go over the items in the psychopathy checklist. So typically it breaks down into two different factors, which I'll go over in a second. But it also is sometimes broken down even further into four factors. So the first factor is interpersonal. So those traits are glib and superficial, grandiose self-worth, pathological lying, and conning and manipulative. And the second factor is affective differences. So they have a lack of remorse or guilt, they have a shallow affect, they're callous and lack empathy, and they fail to accept responsibility. Now the third factor is lifestyle. So they're stimulation seeking, they're impulsive, they're irresponsible, they're parasitic, and they lack realistic goals. And the fourth factor is antisocial behavior. So they have poor behavioral control, they have early behavioral problems, they have juvenile delinquency, revocation of a conditional release, and criminal versatility. 
And then there's two more that are included, which is just promiscuous sexual behavior and many short-term marital relationships. And when they did a factor analysis of the psychopathy checklist, they found it broke down into two major factors. So factor one is selfish, callous, and remorseless use of others. And then the second factor is chronically unstable, antisocial, and social deviant lifestyle. And I think it's interesting that these two factors have different correlates. So factor one is correlated with narcissistic personality disorder, low anxiety, low empathy, low stress reaction, low suicide risk, but has high scores of achievement. And then factor two is found to be more correlated with antisocial personality disorder, social deviant sensation seeking, low socioeconomic status, and a higher risk for suicide. So factor one captures more like the snakes and suits types of psychopath, and then factor two captures more the parasitic junkie type of psychopath. And now to switch gears a little bit, I want to go to the difference between antisocial personality disorder and psychopathy. So a quick review of the DSMs in terms of how the antisocial personality disorder diagnosis came about. The DSM-1 used the term sociopathic personality, and that stressed socially maladaptive aspects and was an interplay between personality and social determinants. And the DSM-1 also had the diagnosis of dissocial personality. And this diagnosis stresses an abnormal social environment, but has a display of strong personal loyalties. Then DSM-2 had antisocial personality, and then DSM-3 just added the word disorder at the end. But there was a big shift that took place between DSM-2 and 3, and this is in regards to how the diagnosis was used. And that's because it shifted its approach to a broader criminal behavior. So the DSM-3 diagnosis framed it in terms of concrete behavioral criteria, and basically had an absence of underlying personality traits. So to really grasp the difference between antisocial personality disorder and psychopathy, let's just quickly go over the DSM-5 criteria for antisocial personality disorder. So it's a pervasive pattern of disregard and violation of rights of others occurring since age 15. It includes failure to conform to social norms, deceitfulness, impulsivity, irritability, reckless disregard for safety of others, consistent irresponsibility, lack of remorse, and a bunch of other stuff. But the thing I want you to focus on is that this criteria focuses on behaviors. So these criteria were developed with researchers in mind, and not therapists. And lack of remorse is really the only internal criteria. So antisocial personality disorder really misses the critical internal subjective states, so that you have this group of people that isn't really uniform, they're completely different. They can have a completely different reason for their behavior. So this diagnosis tends to overdiagnose people with backgrounds of poverty and oppression, and these people tend to run into authority for reasons other than their underlying psychology. And it can underdiagnose people who are successful and socially prominent, but still have a psychopathic trend to them. So I've heard people say you can think of antisocial personality disorder as a spectrum with psychopathy at the far end. But I don't really think that captures it, because there are people with an underlying psychopathic structure that are socially adapted enough to never really run into legal problems. Or even psychiatry, so they never get the diagnosis. And then on the flip side, there are people who are diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder that don't have an underlying psychopathy. These type of people can grow up in an environment that reinforces behavior that lead them to the diagnosis. So I think of antisocial personality disorder as a broader diagnosis that contains a small subsection of psychopaths. So to go over that again, antisocial personality disorder looks at the individual from the outside and looks at their behaviors with a specific emphasis on the social consequences of their behavior. Psychopathy goes a little bit deeper and looks on the inside of the subjective experience of the psychopath and at the internal dynamics that occur within the psychopath. And to me, that's a much more powerful and clinically relevant entity. So, so far we've gone over the descriptors of psychopathy and then how it differs from antisocial personality disorder. But now I want to give you just a quick three-word summary of what goes on in a psychopath. So to understand a psychopath, you have to understand that their main dynamic is that they want to get over on other people. I'll go into more specifics in future videos, but I think that get over on very succinctly captures the main drive for as to why they are manipulative and why they lie and why they're impulsive and why they do antisocial behavior. It really all stems from a power dynamic of wanting to get over on other people. And here's a quote from an interview from Jeffrey Dahmer, where he describes his internal motivation for his acts. Having complete control and dominance over it. So, psychopathy has nothing to do with criminality per se, but it has everything to do with the internal motivation of the individual. And that's why you can see it manifest in different forms, from an evil serial killer, to a malignant dictator, to a callous businessman. It's really all the underlying structure of a power dynamic to get over on other people. Thanks for watching.